Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to Knights of the Pageless Library. We are a little podcast that reviews audiobooks. I am Ryan Knight, and I will be your host for this episode. Today, I will be taking a look at Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson and narrated by Kayulani Lee. I'd like to apologize up front. I am in a hotel room, so if the audio quality is terrible, that's why. But I got to get back into recording somehow, and this was the best way that I found to do it. So hopefully you stick with me through this one. And if you do, I really appreciate it. If you have anything to say about this title, or anything else at all really, please feel free to contact us. kotpl.pod at gmail.com is still the quickest way to get a hold of us. Also, you can kind of just Google search us at this point, and you'll pretty much find us anywhere and everywhere. That also gives you a chance to follow us anywhere and everywhere you would like to do that. Thank you guys again for listening, and let's get into this one. So, Silent Spring was written in 1962 by Rachel Carson. The audiobook version that I will be reviewing was published in 2006 by Recorded Books, LLC. This is not Rachel Carson's only title. She actually is accredited as being a marine biologist, environmentalist, and author. She has several books that all seem to encompass her knowledge as a marine biologist, as well as her broad kind of concern for the treatment of our planet. I didn't really take a look at any of the other titles available on Audible, but just so you know, they are there. So how does Kaiulani Lee perform for this title? This one's kind of unfair to judge her performance on. It's... the book itself is written more like a textbook, therefore the audiobook sounds almost like a lecture, if you will. It's not exactly as if she had a whole lot of characters or emotions or anything to really play with during this one, so... I think her performance is good for the title itself, but I do feel it's unfair to say, like, that she does poorly or that she does amazing, because the... The work that she's actually doing is not really, again, written like a science textbook, narrated kind of like a college seminar, if you will. Take that for what you will at this point. I think she does fine. I will just go ahead and say that. So what exactly is Silent Spring? Uh, It's a very catchy title, that's for sure. And if any of you listen to my The Three Body Problem review, I'm pretty sure in that that I mention that this book is mentioned in that book. Uh, It was a title that, yeah, Wenjie, the book that she is given while she's at the lumber camps that kind of uh, gets her in trouble once she, you know, they're going to write the uh, letter to the higher-ups and whatnot. But that's, that's this book. And this book, apparently, I don't know if that's true or not, but in Three Body, this book, I believe, is banned? in the Chinese Communist Party. So, I don't know if that's true or not, but the reason it is is that this book kind of focuses on and brings attention to the misuse and overuse of industrial pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides, and sort of the fallout that we could be facing, we as humans as well as the Earth itself, the problems we could be running into by using those things without a lot of discretion. It shares a lot of facts and data and scenarios as well in which the misuse of these products has caused harm to humans, livestock, and the land itself. The book highlights the facts that these practices may also not be very effective and in some cases might make the situations actually worse. Apparently, Rachel Carson was kind of a pioneer in this way as far as bringing awareness to some of the crazy things that at least the U.S. government and some governments around the world had been doing with these chemicals, basically. Um, And I will talk more in detail about those a little bit later. But mostly what she's trying to do is get people to focus on the issues that are cropping up as as, as well as look at alternative methods for pest control. The version of the book that I listen to is about 10 hours and 36 minutes long. And it was actually free on Audible with a Prime subscription. Uh, At least I think that's what it is, the Prime subscription. Either way, it was just free. I just added it straight to my library. So I guess there's that, which is pretty cool that it was free. Is this book easy to follow? Yeah, it is very straightforward and it's pretty well laid out. 
in my opinion, it suffers a bit from repetitive information. Um, at a few points, I was thinking, yeah, okay, I get it. I understand you don't have to keep repeating what the scenario was and what the fallout from it was. I understand she was probably trying to just get her point across, but it, it was just a bit repetitive for me. And some of the names of the pesticides are going to be beaten mercilessly into your brain. But I think overall, <clears throat> the book is very easy to follow. It's, it's well laid out enough that even a dummy like me really understands what she's going for here. So what is my recommendation on this one? This is a tough one for me. At first, while I was listening to it, my mouth was hanging open in shock at some points because of the things being stated. I was appalled at the things that we were willing to do to ourselves in the name of pest control. But I will go into more detail after the spoiler wall. A lot of this book cannot be fully taken at face value. It is heavily biased on the subject matter. I mean, for good reason, this is the point she was trying to get across. But the further I went into the book, the more I realized that it sounds a bit, mu a bit more like conspiracy theory. It, it, it would be like conspiracy theories that are very well grounded and also based on things that any of us could actually see with our own eyes. So what exactly do I mean by that, that it sounds like conspiracy theory? Some of the scenarios mentioned make it sound like vast damage was being done on a massive scale, when by the end of the scenario or story being told, you realize it was only a maybe a handful of birds that were killed, possibly by the pesticides being used, in a very small campus. Now, yes, there was damage done that could have solely been caused by the pesticides being used. However, there are plenty of times in this book where it is stated this and that, and I'm <clears throat> quotes here, uh, <laughs> quotes for my own purposes, not necessarily quote directly from the book, but it would be something along the lines of, quote, uh, this and that pesticide was used in this area and X, Y, and Z happened. Very few times is it ever stated, you know, as concrete evidence, such as, quote, this was used, therefore x y and z happened end quote it's much more if you really pay attention it's much more broad terms as far as yes they used ddt or dieldrin or aldrin <laughs> or what have you type of pest control and you know uh several weeks later many dead birds were found in the area it doesn't necessarily say that that is what caused it. I mean, obviously that's what it's pointing to, and that's what it's trying to say, but I think it, the book walks a very fine line of being safe with its statements as well. Many of the scenarios actually in the book, especially ones in which evidence wasn't really given that the chemicals being used are what killed the animals in question. Now there are some with scenarios where the animals are dissected and, you know, trace amounts of the chemicals are found in their blood systems. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what killed the animal. A lot of evidence would point to, yes, that's what happened, but just saying, and I, I don't want to get too spoilery right now, so I'll, I'll try to keep that as brief as possible, but what I'm saying is that the book kind of tends to suffer from correlation equals causation, but we should all know that's not always the case, right? So we got to be careful when we draw those kind of lines. I will go further into detail about some of the scenarios here shortly, but just for now, know that some of this stuff needs to be looked at under a microscope instead of with the naked eye, basically. That's kind of what information you're getting here. And <clears throat> I mean, I'll be honest, like a lot of the information in this book and a lot of the content is fucked up. It really made me take a step back and look at how stupid we as humans can actually be. It sheds a lot of light on the malpractices, poor choices, and horrible blanket decisions that should have never been made in the first place. Overall, I think there is some really good information to be had here. Now, I know this is supposed to be the recommendation portion, but I really don't know who I could recommend this book to, necessarily. The people who want to know the information have probably already heard it. The people who probably should hear the information are never going to listen to it. I will say this, however, if you are squeamish 
uh, you have a lot of anxiety, you're nervous, you're a hypochondriac, or anything along those lines, I suggest you stay away from this title at all costs. Ignorance is bliss in some cases. And if you don't want to, you know, raise your anxiety at all, you might want to steer clear of this one. Now, with all of that being said, I think this is good information for us as a species going forward. It would benefit a lot of people in a lot of places, especially places of power, to not repeat the stupid things we have done in the past. And I'm sure that statement will mostly fall on deaf ears. All right, now I'm gonna pass the spoiler wall and I'm gonna briefly talk about this book as a whole. So if you wanna listen to this one, go ahead and go check it out. But please come back here and hear what I have to say about it. So I think the opening of this book is incredibly strong. It hooks you in with an almost horror movie-like opening in a town that has been blanketed with a pest control substance. This has resulted in the town basically being completely silent. The birds have mostly all died or gone away. Many of the people in the town are either sick or dying or have left as well. But we find out it is not a true story. It is a made-up scenario built based on some of the other stories that did happen in the book. And I was pretty bummed out <laughs> when I found out uh, that it wasn't real, since it was incredibly scary. Uh, it might be a little bit scarier now, though, knowing that some of the things that she's talking about do and have actually happened. It's almost an unfair hook to the book, if I'm being honest. It, it sets it up and, and almost makes it seem like it's a real thing that was witnessed happening. But in reality, she just kind of was picking and choosing different scenarios from around the world at any different time, at any different place, and says, this is something that could happen, or could have happened, or could be happening. So, it's kind of disappointing, if I'm being honest. I'm not going to go through this book in extreme detail. Uh, the book's relatively short. You can gather a lot of info from it within the first couple of chapters alone. I'm going to talk in broad strokes, kind of as the book does through most of it. A large focus in the book early on is going through and talking about the development and implementation of these lab-designed chemicals. Uh, shortly after World War II, I believe it was, probably World War I as well, but um, either way, these chemicals that were being developed most likely for human biological warfare were being tested on bugs to see what the effects would be. Basically, they were trying to make weapons to kill other people, and in turn, they discovered that some of this stuff, surprise, surprise, would kill bugs. So of course, once the war ends, you know, and there's no money flowing from things like that, they decide that they should start selling and marketing this stuff to the masses, you know, as ways of pest control, with little to no harm to humans. None of this stuff was really true, though. The chemicals were found to contain many things that might not kill a human outright or immediately, but if given enough exposure, it can cause tons of problems. <laughs> None of this, however, stopped them from dropping these chemicals in mass, you know, by the ton, basically, directly onto our forests, our farmlands, into our water supplies, and even directly on our cities and towns from planes. It, it, it's pretty insane. Even when it was discovered and known that some of these chemicals would cause neurological and physical harm to humans, as well as livestock, some people still insisted on using it without taking any precautions to protect human life, waterways, or our food sources. This book is full of examples as well of humans blanketing crops to control insects. The target pest, however, is not the only insect affected. The chemicals would be broadly used without any restraint to avoid covering everything in the entire area. Then the birds would come in and eat the bugs, which would in turn develop neurological and muscular problems, causing them to not be able to fly or even be able to reproduce, most likely caused from the buildup of chemicals in their systems that the bugs were also covered in. Some of the birds might even die, and then be eaten by a fox or an opossum. These animals would also then ingest the chemicals that only were supposed to be killing the bugs. There are even a few instances given in which the government wanted to control a specific bug in a specific area, such as the Japanese beetle. So they would load these specific pesticides into a plane, 
and they would plan to dump them onto our cities, suburbs, and the entire surrounding area. They would drop them onto people, their homes, their lawns, in their pools, in the rivers, streams, ponds, and crops. Now there are examples given where this causes plenty of illness in people, and in their house pets as well, in pretty short order. I think one of the biggest things though the book is trying to get through, however, is the long-term effects that are maybe unknown at this point in time when these things are dropped on such a large area, on a large populace of people. It's also trying to get across how silly this type of attack is, since in many cases the target insect was not eradicated at all. And in fact, there are a few instances given where the insect problem actually gets worse because of some of these campaigns that are undertaken. I just want to say too, I used the word silly a second ago, but I feel like this is more uh, apt to say, I want you to imagine this. <clears throat> You're outside, and it's a nice, clear, sunny day, and all of a sudden you think, that's weird. It's snowing out. Look at these little pellets falling from the sky. They were dumping the fucking chemicals like snow falling from the sky on people's heads without giving them any warning, any heads up that it was going to happen. Somebody signed off on this and said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's go ahead and do that. I just want you to take a second and think about how absolutely horrifying that is. Now, some of it is explained later on in the book that because of the insect's ability to adapt to these chemicals in their environment is why these large-scale attacks might not have been successful at all in the first place. Now, people asked, you know, would, not, would humans not develop immunities eventually too to some of these chemicals that are, you know, we're being subject to? And she explains that, yes, we could develop immunities in such an environment, but it might take us several generations over the course of hundreds of years to develop immunities to such things. And that would probably require pretty consistent exposure, and it would also require you to not get sick and die before you were able to pass these traits on, you know, to your children, and hope that they also survive. Now, for insects, they can go through as many generations as it would be needed to develop immunities, simply because of their short life cycles and the way they reproduce in mass. Uh, they could go through the same amount of generations in a couple of weeks, which is why they can actually develop resistances to some of these chemicals so quickly. There are quite a few examples given where some of the chemicals being used to control insects in the beginning were then placed directly on insects or were f insects were found with the chemicals directly on their body, not affecting them in any way in such a short period of time afterwards. So what did we as humans do? We decided that it's just gotta take more chemicals to control those bugs, so we dumped even more chemicals on them, on our food, and on our homes. Again, we go through this again. There's a large portion of the book as well that covers the effect it had on waterways especially. When these planes would fly over the forests and they would be dropping these chemicals, they would take no care as to shut off their sprayers or if they were dropping, you know, the pelletized version or whatever, um, if they were flying over a stream or a pond or any sort of water at all. Due to the nature of a lot of these chemicals, the fish were especially affected, if I understand the book correctly, because a lot of these chemicals were very fat soluble within your tissue. The chemicals would become lodged in the tissue in the fatty tissues and then would build up over time in those tissues because it would never actually be removed from the tissues unless you went through you know an extreme weight loss where you know you'd burn off enough fat to get rid of it even though even if you did most likely though the chemicals would still remain because your body is obviously not trying to use those chemicals versus your fat for anything so the fish would obviously die in droves wash up on the shores and then the birds would eat them and here we are again the birds are consuming the chemicals through this process of eating an animal that was potentially had died from the chemical and or just has the chemical in its body it might not even necessarily have died but these birds would 
you know, some of them would die and be autopsied as well, and the chemicals would be found in them, even if they might not have been directly affected by it at all. It's also mentioned several times in the book that a lot of these chemicals they were using were tested to have lasted in the soil for upwards of a decade or more, even like 12 years or more. I don't really have it in my notes, but I want to mention it too, that there's a chapter as well on herbicides specifically, you know, wondering if herbicides would be harmful to us, you know, like the pesticides would be. Um, and she pretty much says, yeah, absolutely, in a lot of ways. But it's not necessarily even because we consume the herbicides, like we ended up consuming a lot of pesticides. Now, of course, we would consume them if you were, you know, spraying a, a wheat field and you're trying to get rid of a specific weed that's growing in the wheat field, whether it's like a thistle or knapweed or what have you. Um, it would obviously end up being sprayed on most of the crop. Anyways, the crop that's going to be eaten later on. So yeah, there's absolutely a 100% chance that we've all ingested some herbicides, whether we wanted to or not. This part of the book was interesting to me, though, because she talks about how a weed is basically a plant that just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, what do we determine is a weed? Now, with my limited knowledge, I'm assuming it's because most of the things that we've determined are, you know, noxious weeds. Either, you know, you don't really want a whole lot of thistles around because you wouldn't want to step on them or whatever because they are hurt. They hurt a lot. They're pokey and <laughs> they can hurt you really bad. But a lot of these plants also have a very kind of, uh, I want to say the word voracious for some reason. So let's go with that voracious life cycle in which basically their goal is to choke out almost all other plants around them and obviously grow themselves. So if you are trying to grow a pasture of grass, it doesn't do you a lot of good to have these specific weeds growing in them that are going to choke out your grass and not allow your grass to grow. A lot of these weeds as well, uh, like where I live, one of the noxious weeds that we have is knapweed, or excuse me, uh, white top. And white top grows extremely easily, like it has no problem, you know, sticking to the ground and growing like nothing. You know, I plant grass, I give it everything it wants, water and everything, and can't get it to grow, and the white top comes right in, and it's like, I don't even need water, man, don't worry, I'm good. But also that stuff is toxic to cattle and things like that. So obviously farmers are not going to want to have it in the fields with the cows in case the cows eat it, kills the cows, you know, what have you. But this stuff grows so prevalently that if you don't control it, it will eventually take over entire pastures on its own, whether you do anything to help it or not. There's a few interesting points that she makes, too, that, you know, we try to kill things like especially over in the west where I live, uh, we try to kill a lot of sagebrush, which is just kind of silly. Um, I myself was kind of converted by this book because I don't really like sagebrush. I think it looks ugly and I think it's annoying and it's weird and yeah, I, just, I don't really like it. But she makes a good point that obviously sagebrush has grown in this area for who knows how many millions of years by itself, obviously with no help from any human. So what do we do? We move in and we say, well, I want to run cows on this land. And I don't think that the grass that runs, you know, that grows naturally around the sagebrush is good enough. So I want to kill all the sagebrush and grow my own grass out there. Well, <clears throat> the sagebrush, you know, is there for a reason, most likely because it naturally grows there easily on its own. The grass that grows around it also grows around it for a reason. And there's a lot of animals that make their home in those areas with the sagebrush for a reason as well. Sagebrush keeps its foliage in the winter. So for a lot of the time in the winter, even if it's completely covered in snow, the antelope can dig down and still have something to eat when all of the grass has completely died. It's something interesting that I didn't fully think about until I listened to this book. So that was a good piece of information that I gathered from it. I mean, along with many others that I'll probably forget to mention, but that one was, it hit pretty close to home and it was something I did appreciate. The book also goes on to explain how many of these chemicals, and this was already known in the 60s, uh, are considered carcinogens that could rapidly, rapidly cause cancer in animals and or human beings as well. Now, the book gets a little, uh, I want to say that 
she kind of gets out of her lane here a little bit with the carcinogens point and the cancer basically cancer everywhere and it's gonna you know we're causing it to ourselves and things like that now i agree with her on a lot of these points but i think she got a little off the rails here on this part it's towards the end of the book and i thought it was a little disappointing she's basically saying it's everywhere and it's gonna everybody's gonna die of cancer that's basically the point she was trying to say now was she really completely wrong no not really Supposedly, there were even tests done that showed that some of these cancers can be passed on from mother to child while in utero in the womb, which is just... Ugh. <laughs> it's just crazy to me that we would know these things and we would figure out that these things can happen because of something we are doing to ourselves, and we would continue to do it anyways. She also talks at length about different ways that were discovered to control certain insects aside from pesticide. Um, one of the ways they found to control, I think it was the Japanese beetle, was to introduce some sort of bacteria into the dirt and places where these beetles would lay their eggs, you know, and they would hatch into larvae and things like that. And apparently once they were affected by this bacteria, you know, they would go through their normal cycle but this bacteria would like liquefy their insides as soon as they consumed it in the soil or something like that and it would obviously prevent them from reproducing and spreading at all so this was known uh but it wasn't very widely practiced because it's the government said that it was too expensive to do such things but she argued that it wasn't terribly expensive when you compare the fact that instead of having to reapply it every year, the stuff could last for upwards of 20 years. So it might only need to be applied once before the problem would be completely eliminated because those bugs probably wouldn't come back around that area if it was that, you know, deadly for them to live there. But on the other hand, after she said things like that, I was wondering, yeah, but does this bacteria do anything to us? You know, was it proven that in 20 years, this won't affect the people who sprayed it on their lawn also? Or however you put bacteria on your lawn. It was also discovered they could run sterilization campaigns if a certain pest, you know, bug was in an area that they really wanted to eliminate it from. And I believe some of them, I can't remember the exact insects they tried it on, house flies and some other things like that. But basically they would get these animals in the lab these <laughs> bugs they put the bugs in the lab and they would forcefully sterilize them through use of radiation i believe you know <laughs> this all sounds super swell in every regard uh so what they would do then is introduce these sterile males into the general populace of insects and these males would still compete with the non-sterile males for mating rights with females. Well, obviously they would mate and be sterile and not be able to, you know, reproduce, so that entire next generation would not be born. So, and apparently this was done to great effect where it would knock, you know, the numbers of certain insects in certain areas down by tons and tons and tons. So, it might not eradicate them completely, but it was a great method of control, and it would only need to be introduced a couple of times in order to get populations under control. But again, we apparently resorted instead to using chemicals made in the labs and, you know, subjecting ourselves to them as well, unfortunately. She also talks about how they found great success by introducing other competitive insects with the problem insects. As far as, you know, there are, you know, parasitic wasps, I'm sure some people have seen these things, that will, you know, burrow their eggs into the larvae, the larv, larvae, larvae, larva, I don't know how you actually say it, the larva of other insects, and then their babies would hatch inside of those larvae, obviously in consuming it from the inside out. You know, just a nice, peaceful way to control other insects. You know, just set them at war against each other. It sounds great. <sighs> Ugh, gives me the freaking willies just thinking about it. 
Okay, now with all of that stuff being said, and I know for this one I'm kind of grossly paraphrasing this book, but honestly, like, I repeated myself quite a bit, even in my short little synopsis there, and the book kind of does the same thing. You can kind of listen to the first couple of chapters and feel weird about the stuff and, you know, get all anxious about it, and you're pretty much going to... The whole book is pretty much the same way. It's honestly a pretty big scare tactic um, based with some data as well to get people to open their eyes to some of this stuff. And I think that's good. Um, do I think that it's like revolutionary in terms of like you're going to change your life if you listen to it? No, probably not. I think a lot of what bothered me about the book too is that and I mentioned this before that you know it would say there was you know they blanketed this entire city and I think one of them was Detroit that they blanketed with chemicals and the way the book is kind of written and told makes it seem like everybody dropped dead overnight or turned into zombies you know it, it kind of acted like it was setting up something like that but there was something only like a few confirmed cases of people getting sick from the application of pesticide as well as maybe only a few people dying not confirmed on whether or not the pesticide is what caused it so i feel like the book walks a pretty slippery slope and a very fine line of as i said before you know causation equals or uh oh my gosh now i can't even think of the way to say it Correlation equals causation. Sorry, gee, many Christmas. I just feel like it's a little... It's very biased, too. Um, and I will mention quickly that while I was writing... Taking my notes and stuff, that there's another... Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a book or a uh, paper or what have you. Um, but I came across it while I was looking at the stuff. And it's called uh, Silent Spring at 50. The False Crisis of Rachel Carson. And I kind of briefly read through some of it. It's pretty long, um, but not. it's just a PDF file that you could download and, and read for yourself. And from what I gather, it's kind of in opposition to some of the stances taken in Silent Spring. And again, like I said, it tries to call out some of the one-sidedness of that book. It also offers that, you know, she kind of failed to mention some of the times where DDT or other insecticides were actually used to great success to potentially save croplands or forests or what have you. The only thing she seemed to be focusing on were the negative effects of such things. So that's just some food for thought. Um, if you read or listen to Silent Spring and you find yourself terrified to death, you know, from all the death and destruction that she's talking about uh maybe check that one out and it'll maybe help balance you out a little bit now yes i think it is extremely stupid that we would blanket our drinking water um, our food and ourselves in these chemicals specifically designed to kill things i do however think that these things can be used effectively and safely if used correctly I myself will probably suffer later on in life from being exposed to such things due to my time in high school working in agriculture, which agriculture is obviously one of the biggest proponents of using chemicals with absolute abandon, since, you know, if the chemicals were to save the crops, that makes more money. I think the message of this book is good if delivered a bit heavy-handed for my liking. I think it is extremely biased in its position, but again, it's trying to get a point across. I also think that she's spot on, that if we find something that is extremely toxic or deadly to ourselves, we should probably stop using it immediately. She mentions a few times that, you know, and if you go to the store, no longer are chemicals labeled with skull and crossbones because of how deadly they are, you know, but instead they show Pictures of families playing outside with their animals and stuff that you're going to, you know, you're going to use these chemicals on your yard to absolutely eradicate any and all insect life that might survive out there. You would think something like that, that, you know, if you were to drink even a little bit of it, 
would for sure kill you, you'd think Skull and Crossbones would probably still be a good thing to have on a lot of those things. And I have to keep in mind as well that this book is over 50 years old now at this point. So I'm sure a lot of stuff has changed, and there's probably been a lot of advancements in these fields. However, I do still see that we kind of do use do the same thing, you know, with herbicides and pesticides. They're easily accessible to anyone and everyone, and I do still think they're used pretty... Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily know what word I'm looking for, but basically, I mean, they still spray the field right across the street from my house using an airplane. So there's no way that some of that stuff doesn't drift in onto my property, onto me, onto my pets, onto my house, onto my tractor. I mean, it's we still don't do a great job with some of this stuff. I just think that everyone shouldn't forget, you know, that these things might be marketed as perfectly safe or, like I said, they might have a fancy, nice label that makes it look safe. But just be sure to read the fine print. Do not skip that step. I myself have done this far too often, and I'm sure I will suffer the consequences one day because of it. But for now, all I can do is try and be more safe now and encourage others to do the same. You know, wear the PPE, wear gloves, wear goggles, wear a mask, wear, go buy a full white suit, you know, a full zip up suit that covers you, covers all your skin. You know, they're not that expensive. And if you think you might get any on you, it might be a good idea. If you don't have the correct PPE, Maybe don't use the stuff until you get the right PPE. But that's all I got for this one. So let me know you guys' thoughts. I'd be curious. You know, this was a book I just kind of picked up on a whim. And I wasn't really even sure about listening to it. But, you know, it was free. So I checked it out. But I want to thank everybody for listening. And I hope to catch you guys in the next one.